Okay. Hey, everyone, trailblazing families and trailblazing families to be. I am so happy to have um, friends of mine we have met in real life. Um, I think four times we met at the Family Adventure Summit in Canada. Was that the first time? Yep. Yeah. First time. Yes. In Penticton, Canada. And what was that? Four years ago, five years ago? Yes, five, I think. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then the Family Adventure Summit in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. And then we met in Granada, well, La Jadadura, Spain and Granada, Spain, right? Mm -hmm. And then yeah. we're both from the Seattle area, so we've hung out there as well. Um, yep. <laughs> so everyone, these are amazing world schooling parents, two of my favorite world schooling parents, Astrid Vinjay and Clint Bush, um, fellow Seattleites and fellow world schooling parents. So welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, so um, I just, yeah, I love your story and I wanted to sh um, have you guys share it to everyone else. Um, we have a lot of newbies in my group, the uh, World Schooling uh, Traveling Digital Nomad Trailblazing Families group and, you know, experienced world schools too. Some of our friends, our mutual friends, we have so many in the group. Um, so I just wanted to ask you um, some questions and then I'm hoping uh, the people in the group will, can use the chat and ask you guys questions as well. Um, I think when we first met, Astrid, you included me in an article in the Seattle Parent Map magazine, right? It was an online magazine yes. or no, in person. I mean, uh, hard copy too, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a print magazine, but the article was online. Yeah. Yeah. And it was about, you know, families world schooling this new thing. And then you guys started doing it too. So um, tell me a little bit about how you heard about the conference in Canada and how you got involved with the whole world schooling um, movement. Yeah, well, I have been blogging. So I have a blog, it's called The Wandering Daughter and it's um, a world schooling website essentially. But um, I had started it even in 2016. And um, back then I was looking for uh, events, conferences to go to as a blogger. And this one caught my eye because it was more family focused and it was in Canada and it was only five minutes away. Five from, hours. Or sorry, five hours. <laughs> yeah. like five minutes. Yeah. It was only five hours away from- Practically. Um, where we were living. So mm -hmm. I uh, I told Clint about it and I said, hey, there's this conference or there's this summit going on and it's just a bunch of traveling families getting together. And we've been thinking about traveling full time. So why don't we go, you know, the the worst thing that can happen is we just like meet people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, I don't even know. A lot of time, cool people. Yeah. And I don't even know if the time we knew it was full-time travelers I think no it's just traveling families. yeah we just knew it was traveling families which was something we like to do with our kids and stuff and we were all kind of we were already kind of like wander-minded I think um so I think that was and it was over Labor Day weekend so it was really easy weekend to like get away from Seattle and, and go up there so um, yeah that's kind of how we fell into it yeah, and I think um, my kids and I, we had traveled for a year um, up at that point, and then you guys started traveling. So where did you go first? Uh, well, so we decided to do like a road trip around the U.S., and then um, because the next year, the following year's Family Adventure Summit was in Mexico, we decided, well, let's use that as our first international destination, Mexico. Neither of us had been to Mexico. It was a good excuse to like go someplace new and see familiar faces too. Yeah, and we, so we went to that conference, I think, expecting to meet some traveling families, maybe plan like, you know, a few week vacation or someplace or go someplace international. The first. Conference. Yeah, when we first went to the conference, I think we were planning like, you know, we'll meet some people, it'll inspire us to travel, we can add it to our five-year plan or whatever the case was. Um, what we didn't expect is literally on the drive home, we decided that we were going to full-time travel wow. um, after talking to some families there. Um, and we basically got home and in the next three months put together a plan and started preparing Mm -hmm. um to travel full-time so that's yeah that's and you were, yeah. you were actually one of the pardon sorry what were you saying I was gonna say you were actually one of the people that like 
yeah. pushed me at least to to consider that. <laughs> and they, they had a conversation and I was talking about how I I work um you know full time and you're like well can you do you do work on a computer can you do it from anywhere I was like <laughs> Yes. Well, that was going to be my question because, um, you know, Clint, you work in technology. I mean, you guys are both able to work remotely. I mean, it's possible. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we were. Yeah. So I was already I, I was working out of Pioneer Square here in Seattle um, and we lived in West Seattle at the time. Um, so it, was, it wasn't too far away, but um, I just have never been an office person, never really enjoyed going to the office. So I would work from home maybe three days a week already at, at that point. Um, and so kind of depending on the schedule. So it wasn't much of a leap for me. Like when we went to the Penticton conference, everybody we talked to was like, you know, we'd have an excuse of quote unquote excuse, like, um, oh, you know, we have jobs, whatever. Well, that's fine. You can ask your boss if you can work remote, et cetera. And that's, so that's essentially what I did. It was a little unprecedented at my work because there was really only, I think at the time, two other full-time remote people, but they were like stationary remote. They were just like in a different part of the U.S. Um, and so it was unprecedented for someone to basically want to be nomadic, essentially, um, at the company. But my my managers and stuff were actually really supportive about it. Um, and so that was, that was really, we waited though. We planned... I don't know. We planned for at least a few months before uh, yeah, I was, approached that subject yeah. with my boss. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. yeah. So it's kind of like one of those things where we kind of personally had momentum in our brains. And then we were kind of had maybe a backup plan of like, well, if they don't go for it, then, you know, I, I don't know if I was going to quit, but like, I think we had some sort of backup idea of what we might do if, if they were not going to be, uh, right. down for it. So. Okay. And you guys, I mean, prior to the travels, your kids were in regular school and, you know, you're going to the office a couple of days a week. Um, so how much, um, you said it took you three months, like how much did you have to get done? What did you have to get done in those? Well, actually, it actually build? took us nine months to plan. Um, part of, part of that nine months was uh, the school year had just started. And so we decided we'll just wait until the following mm -hmm. school year ends. I guess the the heavy lifting of the planning was in the last six months of it. Well, preparation. Uh, of the preparation, yeah. yeah. It took us three minutes, or three minutes. It took us three months to plan for the preparation, I think. Yeah. Like, both mentally and physically, and just like yeah. kind of wrap our heads around the logistics of it all mm -hmm. until we were ready to actually start preparing. But yeah. And Clint and I come from kind of like corporate backgrounds where like project management is like a <clears throat> part of the our work day. And so we kind of took some of that and put it into this planning and got like a project management tool that we used. And we had like um, boards of tasks that we needed to be done and dead due dates for them. And so, and then we tried to have like at least weekly check-ins of like, okay, where do we stand on this task? Who's responsible for it? What's blocking us? All that stuff. Kind of awesome. just yeah. peeking out on the planning the, um, part of it. The hilarious thing though, is we met another family or she worked was actually working with another family who was getting ready to do the same thing. And we ended up having dinner with them, I think a few months before we were going to leave. Mm -hmm. um, and we were telling them about our whole plan, like, you know, how we were planning we're using project management tools and we were like super geeked out on it and they they show us they they basically had this little piece of paper that they'd written some things on and they're like wow we feel so under planned but then we were talking to them more and they had spent a lot of time emotionally planning like talking this. through yeah. like how how the experience would be emotionally and and we that was something that we, we completely did missed that like we <laughs> We did not talk about this, how it would be emotionally for us, how it would be emotionally for the kids, how like taking them out of school might affect them, how being in one, you know, like basically the four of us isolated for months on end, uh, not isolated, but, you know, yeah. together months on end, like how that might affect. So we definitely took a cue from them of like, I think we need to like step back a second and talk about this from an emotional standpoint yeah. too. well this is why it's so important for us world schoolers to communicate with each other in the facebook groups and do these um you know these streams and all that because there's so many things that we need to learn to live this crazy lifestyle 
And yeah, the emotional stuff. I mean, my kids didn't at first, uh, the first few weeks, they were having a great time. And then it hit them that they were homesick because the first few weeks is like a vacation. And then they realize, like, wow, we're doing this, you know? So um, did your kids get homesick while they were traveling? Oh, yeah, multiple times. I mean, and it ebbs and flows, you know. Um, I, I, uh, I read a little bit about like, you know, the culture, the cycle of like cultural adjustment and stuff. And I tried to apply that to our travels too. So, you know, after that, like nostalgia or not the novelty phase, Mm -hmm. we all kind of went through our phases of like, uh, low points. Low points. Yeah. And it didn't always occur at the same time. So sometimes I would be really excited about a place that we were at, but the kids are like, oh, not another museum or like, do we have to go out? I just want to go sit and play Minecraft. on. The- <laughs> and tell us again, Art. the age of your kids when you started traveling. And by the way, Jeff from Walla Walla, Washington is saying hello. He is online, uh, but he oh, asked okay. that question. Okay. Uh, the ages of our kids. So when we first started traveling, our kids were eight and five. And so then, and then we ended, or we came back to the U.S. Um, when they were 12 and nine. Yeah, actually, our, our youngest son, uh, he was turning five oh, yeah, when we left our house in Seattle. So we, and we said, like Astrid said, we started with a four month road trip around the U.S., um, and so he was turning five just as we left um, there. So they were um, pretty young. Um, yeah, pretty young. And he, I'd say our daughter missed it more because she was in school full time. So she, I think, had the like a little bit more of the homesickness, um, yeah. whereas uh, our son was, I think, just too young, really, to kind of understand the homesickness aspect. Yeah, so she had already created like some close friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and whereas my, our son was like too young to really like solidify friendships yet. And so we were always kind of his, his world. Did did you have homesick? I don't think I, I don't remember feeling homesickness. I probably did, but. You had family sickness of like, I want to be close to my mom. I want to be with my son and all that stuff. Yeah. And that's that's something that extended before because I don't live near them. I missed family members and friends, but I didn't miss the suburban life and the, you know, just every, the sameness of everything back where you are. I mean, a couple of restaurants I missed um, and Trader Joe's, but um, okay. So (laughs) where were the places that you went? I mean, you don't have to give an exhaustive list, but where were some of your favorite places that you went in the last four years? Well, can I start real quick with the first place? Like, so we went to Mexico first and uh, we had no idea what to expect. We'd never been, um, we didn't really know much about it. Uh, Like I said, Mexico was because that's where the family adventure summit was going to be. We thought that's a great place to start because it was a, almost exactly a year after the, the first one we went to. Um, and so uh, we got to Mexico City and it was not too shocking culturally wise because we've been to Indonesia multiple times. We've been to India. Um, we've been to South America. So like culturally wise, like I think I mean, Mexico City is an amazing city. It's really developed. It's it's just this like really booming metropolis. So I think the size of it, I think it was a little intimidating, but I think all of a sudden being, and we've had this before, but like being faced with, oh, I don't speak the language at all and have to get through. So there was a little bit of that. So there's a little bit of discomfort, but then, and we had to figure out the bus system because we took a bus from Mexico City to San Miguel de Allende. But then we got to San Miguel de Allende and like, like, I don't want to overhype that place too much because it is beautiful, but like there's a lot of other parts of Mexico we absolutely fell in love with oh, more so. But there was just something about like being there and taking the bus from Mexico City to San Miguel de Allende and seeing that part of America, which I grew up in Colorado in the Southwest and it's similar, but it's also diff- way different. Um, and so I was just like, it, that memory itself, I think, started kind of our 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 love affair, I guess, or our just our passion for Mexico. Yeah. Um, it's a beautiful and, city. It's almost like Disneyland. It's so gorgeous, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's gorgeous yeah. Little- and so I think I think Mexico in general was probably one of our favorite 
places. We had initially planned to stay in Mexico for only four months and then do two months in, in Costa Rica. But um, as the four month, as that first four months of Mexico kind of uh, closed out or start came to an end and we were starting to plan for Costa Rica, I was like, well, one, it's so much more expensive in Costa Rica than Mexico. So I'm like, wait, why are we trying to like, you know, bend over backwards to find budget places when we can just extend our stay in Costa Rica and Mexico. And so we ended up swapping out, like um, extending our time in Mexico to like six months. The full six months, yeah. And okay. only spending like two months, two weeks in Costa Rica. Okay, so did you travel around uh, Mexico? Did you? Oh yeah, did, yeah. We buses, like, flights? it was, uh, we mainly did buses that time around yeah. and we just like, took um, from like central Mexico, we went to the Pacific coast. We did fly up to like the Baja Peninsula and then back in inland as well. But like subsequent trips uh, to Mexico, now we've been, we've been back like at least three or four times now. Um, we've done like planes or uh, yeah, some, yeah, yeah, or sometimes we'll like Oh, rent yeah. a car or something yeah. especially yeah. when we were traveling just after the pandemic we just didn't feel oh, right comfortable. yeah um, and i want to yeah. mention some of the buses in mexico are really luxurious i mean your seats oh, yeah. are like almost yeah. like business class first class seats in an airplane they're nice and they're double yeah. decked. and the first class tickets are like only a few dollars more yeah. than the coach or the coach i guess you would call the other seats um yeah so it's like totally worth it uh but yeah, and some of the places you don't want to take a bus just because like, for example, from Oaxaca City to Puerto Escondido, we had looked at taking a bus, like flying into Oaxaca City and then taking a bus to Puerto Escondido. But that road is like a winding mountain road that takes seven hours or so. So we were like, uh, I don't know, we'll, we'll just fly on that one. But, and that one yeah. is weird because there is a flight, there's like a propeller plane that goes from Oaxaca City to Puerto Escondido. Or you could take a regular plane that routes you through Mexico City and then back down. So that's, I think, what that's we ended up. Funny. Yeah. Um, Jeff has a question. Um, I think he's, um, I talked to Jeff the other day about the Project World School Family Summit that's coming up in Mexico in March. I think he, um, Jeff, I think you think we're talking about the Family Adventure Summit. It's a, it's a different summit. Mm -hmm. The Family Adventure Summit ran for a few years and it stopped during the pandemic. So this yeah. summit unfortunately no longer exists. Um, but you took your kids to the first one that you went um, in Canada, yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So do you think that was important for them to go to the conference? Because I think Jeff is thinking about going to the one in uh, Mexico that Lainey is running. Yes. And yeah. I definitely recommend um, going to these like world schooling events, not just for us, but for the kids. So like mm -hmm. anything where there's like a, a, even if it's like a pop-up or like a meetup or something, like connect with other families um, so that parents can connect, but kids can also develop relationships. Um, we, we did... We didn't, unfortunately, didn't get a chance to go to last year's um, Project World School Summit. That was the first one that we were going to go to, but we had like a family emergency. And, um, but we've done other stuff like uh, we, Stone Soup, yeah, Stone Soup another, was yeah. a month long pop, pop up in first in Mexico, which we didn't go to, but we went to the one in Indonesia. And then um, uh, there's also like that Anahata. Um, world school community that Patty Rojas was running for a while, mm -hmm. um, which we stayed with them for a month. And it was amazing, like just being able to be in the same community with other traveling families who are like us or who think like us. And then the, the kids just like having them have a chance to connect with other kids and yeah. And or the La Ardura one. Oh, yeah, Spain. like in Spain, yeah. there's yeah. also World School community. Yeah, there. there's also a community of, of families, and it's kind of more informal uh, and um, not as planned, but it's definitely like if you can find those things while you're traveling, seek them out and um, because it's a great way to meet other families. Well, and here's the crazy thing that like the, the crazy, amazing thing about it is once you go to one, 
these circles overlap so much. Oh yeah. So once you go to one, you're going to talk to families that are going to something else that you'll see other families at, or maybe even the same families. And then you'll go to something else. Like there is the, the ability for these things to be chained together. It's incredible. And it's one of the most fun things over the last like year that we've seen is just following our Facebook friends and seeing overlap of people yeah. who've never met before, but are part of our individual world schooling circles, like meeting up together and having good time, like whether yeah. it's Turkey or where you, you know, yeah, Liz, in Bankso or you guys were in um, uh, Bulgaria last winter and um, our friends Via and Lizelle, who we met at the mm -hmm. Family Adventure Summit in um, in Indonesia was there. And then our friends, Sarah and Massimo were there too. And I think you all were at the same yeah. place. Yeah. I was like, we had a dinner together. I love it. I wish you were here with us. Yeah. <laughs> that dinner in Istanbul. Um, that's great. So uh, Sonia V has a question. She has lots of experience with long bus rides of her own, but she um, she and her family are going to South America. They're going to spend, I think, about a year there. Um, so they have a five-year-old. So any tips for long bus rides with little kids? Yeah, lots of snacks because mm -hmm. uh, it's unpredictable whether the buses will stop or not a lot of times they will yeah um, especially at, like little like food stands along the way where they sell snacks and fruits or things like that depending where you're at obviously um, but definitely lots of snacks um, and just I mean just like a five hour or seven hour plane ride um, our our kid our son at the time was about that age and we did we had lots so we switched to all electronic stuff, meaning we didn't bring any physical books um, with us just because of the weight and the, the traveling and all that stuff. So we had we had stuff on Kindle. He was, I think he was starting to read. No, maybe that was before he was starting to read. So we were just reading books to him. They each had a backpack. Um, when we started traveling, they each had a backpack that they brought um, toys, like toys that they wanted. So it was like, I think it's like Lego and some cars and some dinosaurs and things like that for him. Um, so it was, um, it, not gonna lie, it's tough. And those, those five hour bus rides are tough. Um, we tried to get him to rest as much as possible just because the winding road, especially if you're sitting in the back of the bus can make, can make you really car sick um, yeah. as well tip is to sit in the front if you can near the front yeah. so you can see out the mm -hmm. front wheel windshield the one other thing i would say is try to break it up if yeah, you that's can what I was gonna say. Yeah, yeah yeah especially if you're gonna be um in a country or for an extended period of time then there's not really any rush to get from one place to another so like you know if you're if one bus ride will take 18 hours, but maybe two or three bus rides will be, you know, you could break it up and then extend that to instead of like doing it for a day, it takes you like a week to yeah. get. And then you can visit a couple more places on the way. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think the other thing was um, also just like use the bathrooms when you like take yes. bathroom breaks oh, man. when the bus stops too. <laughs> yeah, I think that's just our travel advice in general like, is whenever there's a bathroom opportunity, absolutely take yeah. it. Like don't, even if everyone's like, no, we're okay. No, you Try. have no idea when you're going to come across another bathroom. Yeah, so. that's great. Um, so tell us over the four years that you've been traveling, how has world schooling and traveling as a family benefited your family's life? Well, I think for me, it has helped us um, communicate a lot better. And I know like before, I don't know, I, if you're going to be, if we're, if you're traveling 24 seven with the same group of people, you know, you can't have, I mean, conflict is going to happen, but when we're at home, we can sort of like, oh, fine, I'll just deal with it later when I get back from work, or we'll talk about this when you get back home from school. Well, you're traveling on the road. There is no, I mean, there is a little hard bit to of hide. Work. Yeah. yeah. There's not and, many places to escape. And so you have to address it or choose to say, okay, we're going to talk about it later, but you know, right now is not, you know, 
Mm-hmm. Right now, we just need to like think about it more. But um, so I think that's something that we've tried to help our kids um, develop skills to do as well. And in, in terms of just like talking about how you're feeling and um, like identifying emotions that you're feeling. I know that it's a work in progress for all of us, but I think that that's one thing that travel, this this type of travel lifestyle has really afforded us. And for me, for me, and I see it in the kids too, like just becoming more intentional about stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love this word intentionality. It's just, it's like, I use it all the time because it really was, that was one of the things about it was, you know, when you're, when you're traveling around, like everything you do, even going to the grocery store, like you, you have to be intentional about going to the grocery store, knowing what you want and being okay with like being totally flustered at the grocery store and figuring out what you need. Right. And one of the things that we've really become intentional about as a family is finding downtime, making sure downtime. And like here, anyone who's used to like being kind of traditional Western culture, especially the United States, like it's so easy to just have your schedule packed completely full um, minute to minute. And um, our kids are very vocal now about needing that downtime and not wanting to be overscheduled. Um, and we are too, we like, we feel it when we are. Uh, I especially feel it when I am. Um, and just like, mm-hmm. that's, I think one of the key aspects that, that I came across was, is we have, we have a very keen awareness now of how important downtime is, is for us. Yeah. And that's something that you have to balance as a, as a traveling family, like, especially when you're on the road, because it's so easy to say like, you know, everybody gets FOMO when they, when they travel to someplace new and they're like, oh, I want to go see this and I want to see this and this and this. And, and then you pack your calendar up for, um, I don't know, with like all these activities. And then you wonder why you're so tired all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so one of the things that we did whenever we would go to a new place and we'd have a month there, I'd put the calendar up on the, on our wall and then we'd schedule out, okay, this day we'll just go here, but these are days that we're just going to do chill out days, you know? So yeah. I would schedule out like chill out days and exploration days and only do one activity per and you have a physical calendar yeah 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 just like um uh like a laminated calendar that i would just yeah laminated piece of paper that we had a calendar drawn on yeah okay good awesome um so what kind of challenges have you guys faced over the last four years of traveling um Everyone's a social, and we did to an extent, I, but I think not in the way that I think you think you're going to face when you before you start traveling. So uh, I'll put it this way: the social challenges that we came across was not that we weren't we weren't being social. In fact, I think the challenge we faced was there was a tendency to be overly social, meaning you would meet you would meet up with with people you'd never met or, or, you know, people you'd seen before. And because you're both traveling, it's a different mindset than like when you're living in a place because people have jobs or schedules, you have to work around, et cetera. So you have an hour to meet up here or an hour to meet up there. Right. When you're traveling, it's so interesting. This happened a lot where you're like, we're literally not doing anything all day. And when you just hang out all day with of a family potentially or the next day. Or the next day. Yeah. yeah. I, we were in Vietnam with, uh, with our friends, Viet and Mazelle, like we said, and they, they only had a th- three days left before they were leaving Vietnam. And so we met up briefly. This was the first time we met them outside of family adventure summit. And we met up, we had a great time. We had lunch. We walked around Hanoi a little bit. And then we're like, they're we're like, what are you guys doing for the next three days before you leave? And they're like, I don't know. We don't really have much plan and stuff. So we just ended up hanging out a little bit every day for those three days. That's awesome, um, right? It's absolutely amazing. But the one thing, the challenge comes with that intense social connection is you have to, at least for our families, we had to we realized we had to step back and then also have just family time for. Mm-hmm 
for a few days to kind of reset. Or um, work time. Or work because, time. Yeah. yeah. I, I travel and I'm working and I meet with people who are taking a sabbatical from their work and they have plenty of time to go out every day. And I just, I yeah. have FOMO from that. Like, oh, yeah. I have yeah. stuff I have to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's our advice for our families, especially if you're going to be joining up with these <clears throat> world schooling communities is for as much socializing as you're doing. Also be aware of like your threshold, your family's personal threshold of like, where do we feel like we're out of balance then because we're spending all this time with other people. And I remember one, one time one of our other friends, um, we were at the Stone Soup um, in Indonesia and I just remember like I was so impressed with her ability she just one morning at kind of the gathering the the social gathering she just made an announcement and she's like our family needs isolation time for the next like for the next the rest of this day and a part of tomorrow um just please don't visit us we're just going to like like kind of recoup socially. Um, and like, I think you just have, you have to be vocal. And the amazing part is the families that we met and everything, like you do, you not only communicate better internally as a family, but I feel like you do end up communicating to other people, like your needs a little bit more. Um, and people are also okay with that. So that's, that's, uh, that's, it was interesting. That's awesome. Let's talk about how your kids were learning while you were traveling, because you were doing a bit of homeschooling right um so can you explain like what you had them do and obviously yeah uh, you know your son was five so he probably didn't do a whole lot at the beginning but what did you have them um focus on well so the first two years of our travels he was mainly working and then i was doing like freelance writing and um so my our work hours were were different and so the bulk or actually all of the homeschooling ended up um falling under me but when um but then in 2020 we uh I ended up uh working full-time and so then we had to re refigure out like a more equitable distribution of the homeschooling stuff um but so then he would do like you know the math part which we really focused on like that was something that was um, important for us was for the kids to understand math and then also to be able to write. And that was like what I would focus on. And then all the other stuff kind of, oh, and then the, the kids would do like independent reading um, on their own. And then all the other stuff would sort of just be like organic, like, oh, well, we're in this place. For, for example, we spent three months in Spain. So, okay, we're in Spain. Let's learn about the Romans, the Phoenicians, the Arabs. Like, let's do that as part of like this historical thing unit that we're doing. And then we go and visit those places, you know, visit the salt, the salt factory or visit like this Roman bridge or go to Alhambra and learn about like, you know, the Muslims. And so that's sort of how we, we did our homeschooling. And um I would call ourselves unschoolers but we did because we didn't really follow we had kind of like an eclectic curriculum yeah but um but we were still we were still teaching a bit of a curriculum so we weren't yeah. quite that's eclectic yeah. homeschooling I mean you still had you know math and reading and writing and then the rest of it was not unschooling I think a lot of um world schooling families do that I mean many unschool fully but um yeah. I think a lot of them do the way you guys um, did. And so did that benefit when your kids went back to school and they, they decided to go back to school, correct? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so if we, it was up to us, we'd be traveling. Stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, yeah, well, we, we, we will talk about that, but, uh, but they decided to go back to school and that's why you went back to your home base. Right. Yeah. And that's why, and that's why we focus, like we put heavy focus. That was the only thing we had really had curriculum with was the writing, reading and math. Um, and that's why we put heavy curric or a heavy focus on that is because we knew at some point they were going to go back to school. At least our daughter was. She she'd already expressed she'd want to go back to high school. Um, and so we knew for them to pick up kind of with their peers in school that their <clears throat> the math, reading, and writing skills would have to be would have to match, match or exceed what their peers would be at. So that's mm -hmm. that's why we followed curriculum specifically for that. 
Okay, and how was and, the transition into school? What, did they do okay? Were there any gaps? Yeah, oh, yes, they were They were totally fine. It was like not, not. four years and, you know, they just slid right back in. Although our daughter came back home and she was like, mom, you didn't make me memorize the continents. <laughs> like, what You're is like, it we matter? already visited you, half you of them. Yeah, no, the, the the subject matter, they were great. The, the te- they've they've made social social circles within school. They they really enjoy the structure of school. Um, they don't enjoy the schedule, meaning the day-to-day morning schedule and how many days uh, during the school year they have to be at school. Mm-hmm. Um, they definitely miss that aspect of homeschooling, but they um they like the structure throughout the day and the classwork and they get home and they do their homework without even us really prompting. In fact, they stress out if they don't do their homework. It's just, yeah, it's just wild. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't understand. Yeah. So. Well, okay. And so, but this transition has been a little tougher on you guys, especially Clint, right? You're not, you'd rather be traveling. So how are you guys dealing with that? Uh, oh man. And what is, what is frustrating I, you about being back? Yeah, like, what is I, don't, I don't know if I am dealing with it very well. Uh, so, I mean, one, one reason, like when we left, when we left Seattle area, one of the reasons, at least for me, we left is because I was having a really hard time being in Seattle. Um, the weather, the cost of living, the, just the, the, the intensity of living here um, was really bothering me, the commute, the traffic, everything. And so when we left, that was one thing that I was just, I was so happy to be rid of, um, and or at least in that kind of intensity of it, um, and so that has come back full fold, like coming back for me. And so part of it is that we moved back to the same location we were before, um, so I'm dealing with the same things, the weather, the yeah. the cost of living, that kind of stuff. You have family um, in the area, that's why you decided to go back, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, um, and then. The other aspect for me is that, like, I really felt like I found my community while we were traveling. Um, I really felt like I connected with a lot of people. I had great conversations. So just um, and so, I have not found community back here in Seattle. I've not um, the community that I had here um, is different than what I found um, elsewhere, and so I'm adjusting to that. Um, or I'm trying to adjust to that. You didn't grow up in the Seattle area, correct? No, I grew up in Colorado. I moved here after college. So okay. I, I've been in Seattle for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. It's just hard so, for we adults to make new friends, you know? Yeah, yeah. it really is. And, it, and that was the thing like with world schooling is like you, it was almost like these, almost like socializing in a vacuum, so to speak, because you were, because you would be at these, get togethers meetups or these communities and people would hang out together that all were like already kind of had something major in common right and so it was this really everyone was eager to make friends yeah yeah exactly and and converse and hang out and had unique you know schedules or unique circumstances most of them were homeschooling their kids or at least had experience doing that or were Right. Or we're schooling internationally, which was which was also like it was like everyone was kind of not part of or not like had already kind of broken away from the quote unquote normal right. lives. That and you're back in it. So you're you know, it's it must be a struggle. Um, I mean, for me, because I think I mentioned to you, um, one of my daughters is in the Seattle area. So we're going to be going back and forth. So I'm, we're we're. Yeah going from being full-time uh, world schoolers for six years to part-time. And I guess for me, I'm always just going to say, yeah, but I, I have a trip in the future. And or and someday when my kids are gone, um, me and Astrid and Clint and our friends, we're going to world school together or, and without our kids, right? The empty nesters and caravan around. I just look forward to that kind of stuff. Do you have that to look forward to? I do. I'm well, trying. She's going to Mexico this, this yeah. February, this yeah. month. And then we're going to um, California in April and New York in November. So we have these like short trips planned. Yeah. But it, no, and then potentially somewhere for the summer. So yeah. there, 
We are, yeah, for sure. It it what's one of the challenges for me that I'm trying to adjust to is I'm back to like vacation days because when we were traveling before, we were traveling long term. So we would we would go to a place and live there for like a month to two months or three. And so I actually didn't need to take a lot of vacation days. It was mostly we took vacation days on travel days that we knew we were going to be on a plane or a bus or something like that. Um, but for the most part, we were in the places we were already. So an evening out to go explore or a weekend to go explore yeah. was totally doable. Or like when we were in Europe, for example, we worked in the evenings because we were in the U.S. hours. Mm -hmm. So we would explore during the day and then work in the evening. So um, but now because we're here, everything is based on vacation days. So mm -hmm. I only have a certain amount of vacation days. The kids only have a certain amount of time they can take off. Mm -hmm. um, so we, I am looking forward to those trips and they are, but they're contextually completely different too. So I'm, yeah, right. I'm processing that as well. Well, yeah. we're hoping to, now we have to adjust our travels to the school schedule, which is why, you know, then it, during the school year, it's like just short trips, but um, we're hoping like in the summertime to do at least a month in one location. And then we can do that mm -hmm. sort of like slow yeah. travel feel that we prefer. And it's hard too, because I'm also like struggling with like, I ref I do a lot of reflection. So I'm struggling with like, we're totally privileged. Like we're completely privileged. Like this, this like, this context or this conflict that I'm feeling is only coming from a, a perspective of being privileged. And so um, But the feelings are valid, true. they're valid and they're normal. And yeah. I think lots of parents or you know families that go back to uh, the normal life they they they're going through it too so um uh, jennifer jen saying i went in on an empty nester travel group we are doing this sure, yeah. new facebook group right yeah, <laughs> yeah totally uh, totally we got to start it now um uh, nancy is asking, I wonder how can we bring the values of the world school experience back home with you that's a great question uh what one, one of the things that i said earlier was like um having downtime, for example, that was one of our internal values that we gained from homeschooling. Um, I think one of the other ones that's not necessarily internal to our family, but um, we also just saw how um, pollution and stuff affects the rest of the world in ways that we as the U.S. don't really think about. Recycling is a, a big one. We saw that when we were in Indonesia. In fact, in Indonesia, when we were in Indonesia was when the whole um the whole thing happened where recycling um China China, basically yeah China basically, basically stopped accepting plastic. a lot of our plastic recycling and um, so a lot of that started getting filtered to Indonesia and so um in the U.S. we don't even think about it we put things in the recycle bin and we're like yep yeah, that's cool it's going it's going good but what we don't realize is behind the scenes that's being sold at a mass market and it's being shipped to other countries who are basically just taking it um, as some sort of deal or whatever. Um, and only less than 10% of the plastics are actually getting processed and a lot of it's ending up in the oceans. Um, and so um, I think one of the things that, one of the values that we came away with, like coming back to the US, we live in a bubble here in the US. Like there are so much about it, about living here that we are sheltered from or that we just have this kind of ego about um, that is not the case. And the rest of the world um, in ways lives better than we do. We live better than some places do, um, but we're not the best. They're not the best. There's like this ebb and flow of things that other places do better than us and that we do better than them. And like, just like this humbling, like, um, like, you know, get outside this bubble, so to speak, and just experience, even if you just go literally south of the border, to Mexico and see how they do things there. Um, and you'll see like things are better there in some ways and things are also harder there in some ways. Yeah. So. I think that's the biggest, uh, that's the biggest challenge of like taking what you've learned from world schooling and, and bringing it back home because that mindset is so different from what's here at home. And so you're constantly like pushing against it. And so yeah. yeah. Well, one piece of advice I would say, just, just reflect a lot. Like when, when you feel, when you're out, when you're traveling and you're like, this feels good right now, 
try to write that down. What it is about that feeling that you're feeling. What is it that that it's capturing? That it's what emotion is it filling? And then, because when you come back to the the states or Canada or wherever you're coming back to or Europe, it's so easy to just fall back into the same lifestyle that you had before. But then you have this written thing that you can now read, reflect, and try to be intentional about changing. Um, and even at that, like we did that, and I still oh, I'm struggling. So it's yeah. it's still hard to do, right? But like without that, without those moments, I have like notes and notes on my phone of like things that, as a family that brought us joy. Um, I love that. that was well, and and also bring your kids into that conversation too, yeah. because they're going to be experiencing this as well, and you know, give them a space to share their thoughts and their feelings and and identify things that they're feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and so um, I, I know we said we were going to try to keep it at 45 minutes, but I think we're going to go a little longer because you guys are so wonderful to talk with. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, but I wanted to ask, I mean, you have so much wisdom to share and such a great perspective and, you know, your, your real feelings. I love that. Um, and Astrid, I was going to ask um, what advice, well, both of you, you would give to world school newbies. And I know you have a perfect way to transfer that to people with your lovely new ebook about yes. family gap year. So tell us about your wonderful new ebook. Yeah, so um, I wrote it as a way to help families do like, you know, the act, the planning of it. And you last week you had Zaley, um, or earlier you had Zaley on and she's like a fantastic resource. And I think her book is, is um, great for like the um, sharing people's stories. And I think what I wanted with my ebook was more of like the let's get down hands on activities like so um, every chapter kind of walks you through the steps of planning a a family gap year from like talking about it with your family to putting together the budget to putting together like picking out your destinations um, minimizing your stuff so every every little every little thing kind of gets covered in that and and there's prompts and um activities that you can do with your family to um to go through it and i got it here on the picture you can see it's called hey kids let's go travel um and you can find it on my website uh the wandering daughter and uh, as well as other resources like. Right. Uh, I mean, you have a big blog full of great travel articles, too. I mean, there's yes, such yeah, a wealth yeah. of information. Yeah, what I really wanted to do was just give families a resource for um, world schooling, like give them um, information about the destinations that we visited, like talking candidly about what that world schooling lifestyle is and then also um encouraging them to uh to like world school and and travel the world in a in a responsible way and we we love talking about this like I, so i mean you know we've we've spoken to several families who who were about to start like they just they found us on facebook or whatever or someone referred them to us and they just they sent us a private message and we did a call with them or something like that um because uh we're pretty transparent like we don't <laughs> we we talk about the good and the bad and uh and every everything in between um but i i think one of the things like one of the biggest pieces of advice that like i always like to give is is two things one just start start small it doesn't matter like i know like your audience is they're in the planning stage or whatever and they may reach a point where like it's hard for them to actually take the leap, right? Actually to go or anybody really. And so, you know, we started with a four month trip around the U S cause that was the small step for us. And then we kind of iterated or we kind of stair stepped time zones until we got basically to Asia. Um, and that was a way for us to kind of go small. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing that we found that I know a lot of world schoolers say this, so it's like pretty common advice at this point, but I think it's hard for you to process it until you've actually done it is go slow, just go slow. Like 
one to two week travel is insane. It's just, it's so hard to sustain. It's, it's exhausting. It's expensive. Um, as soon as you start going one to two months in locations, uh, yeah. it's amazing how that opens up just a completely different experience. Yeah. Um, I think in our four years of travel, we visited 11 countries. So okay, so that's, that's not that many in four years. Not a lot compared to some other families who've been, who've been to like, you know, a hundred countries in, yeah. in that many years. And granted we were working, so we couldn't go fast because we just couldn't sustain that schedule. But even families that we know that don't have to work um, full-time day to day, um, they, We've just spoken and they love, they love slow travel. It's just a completely different experience. Now, do you think your kids will ever consider in the future taking a gap year, another gap year? Oh yeah. We've yeah. already talked about it. Yeah. Actually, that was one of our, our daughter was like, well, when I graduate high school, I'm going to take time off or I'm not going to go to college. I'm going to go and travel uh, on her own. So I'm wondering I, in between I now and then, like take, you know, when she's 14 or 15, take that year off. Yeah, yeah, we're, I mean, right now, we're kind of taking it, you know, one season at a time, let's mm -hmm. just say, not one day at a time, but at least like one season at a time of like, okay, for this school year, we're here, Yeah. next school year, we will be here, maybe partially we'll, we'll leave, but like, we're kind of just seeing how the kids feel um, as, as each month Kind of progressive but they definitely they've definitely expressed desire to go travel a little bit maybe not as long term as we were doing before yeah um, but they definitely have an, an interest in especially our son who feels like he was too young for a lot of it yeah and he feels like he doesn't remember a lot of it yeah he's really keen on traveling again yeah he's like oh i wish that i had appreciated it when i was there i'm like you were fine yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just in his own well good hopefully he has a travel it um, there's a couple uh, questions um, people are asking. Um, so Nubi is asking, are there any things you would have done um, differently to make your world schooling easier for your kids? Are you happy the way good things question. went? Yeah, good question. Yeah. I think that I would have, you know, um, when Clint was saying, talking about my friend who had, or that, that other family that had done like more of like the emotional planning versus like us, I think that was something that I wish we had done differently. I wish that we had been more like intentional about talking about feelings more and talking about like what our expectations are for being on the road. And like, as we started progress or as we, as we were traveling, we did have those like moments of reflection, but I feel like, I think that was something that I wish we had done more of. Yeah. I think we, I think we probably would have, or for me, I think it would have been trying to stay longer in locations. Now, granted, we were slow traveling, but we were only doing basically an average of a month. Um, in a city. In a city and before moving okay. on. And I think, I think our kids probably would have wanted to go a little bit slower, like more like two months so that they could do more activities or we could meet more people or et cetera. So um, I think even slowing down even more um, probably would have been, it would have been more helpful. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's lots of comments. A lot of people are, um, I guess they're, some people have the same feelings you have on re-entry and, and et cetera. So please come to the chat and you okay. know uh, interact with the people. Um, yeah, yeah. and I have included your, um, the wandering daughter.com okay. website there to everyone yeah. check it out. I was going to ask you guys a little bit more, um, questions about, you know, tips and tricks and practicalities and logistics, but they're in the book. So everyone get, get after the book and you guys also have a card game that you invented. So you want to mention that? Cause that's a I good did. card game to take traveling see, with you. See, see. Yeah. 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 It's called so stack it's small. scoops. Yep. Um, so ice cream actually scoops like ice cream scoops, right? Yeah. Yes. Like ice cream scoops. So, um, one of the things that is really great about world schooling is that you get exposed to so many different ideas and lifestyles just by like the people that you meet. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, um, I don't know if we had, would have made a game had we not been traveling, 
to be honest. I think so because of the people we met and who were who were doing yeah. like business minded people and yeah, yeah. project minded. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, this was a game that we created while we were in lockdown in Vietnam during uh, March 2020. Basically, yeah. like we were that was like the beginning of the pandemic or uh, yeah, the, the beginning. peak of it kind of. And um, Vietnam had shut down its borders. We were like stuck and um, didn't have any place to go. We couldn't even like leave our apartment or our house. And so Clint and um, our daughter decided to just for fun, create a new game. And then it sort of morphed into this like idea of like, oh, well, what if we make this into a product and what if we sold it on Amazon? Cause I wanted to get into like the Amazon FBA um, uh, business model. And, and so we, we decided that we did, we would do it. We're like, well, you know, you have some experience with design. I have some experience with like mm -hmm. selling online. This is something we could do. And then, and then we did it. And so that, that's sort of like- involved like, too. Yes, yeah. the kids were involved as well. But I think it's like that that mindset of, yeah, this is something we could totally do instead of like, a, oh, well, I've never done this before. I don't want to do it. You know, it's sort of like unique to not unique, but I think that it's it's common among um, world schoolers. It's also unique to our schedule a little bit. Right. Like so the we came we like we were we were playing this game and my daughter and I were like, oh, it'd be fun to invent something. So we started talking about the ideas and literally the next day we're cutting out pieces of paper and drawing like, like a draft of the cards. Wow. But part of it is that we were working in the evenings. Mm -hmm. So we had, and it was lockdown. So it was, oh. we had all day to like do whatever inside the apartment. So we we basically in two weeks had this game flushed out and designed and ready to like send PDFs to our friends to kind of play test and, yeah. and, and Amazing. whatnot. So it was, yeah. it was kind of the, the speed at which we were able to create it was kind of unique to the, the circumstances. Yeah. I love that story. Um, I have one last question for you. I know, Astrid, you've written about this before, about traveling as a family of color. And can you let us know, has that ever been a challenge for you guys? Has it been um, a good thing being able to kind of blend in in some places? Or what's your experience been like? I think it's been both. Like, in some cases, it has been a challenge. I know that, like, for instance, going into the UK, um, we had some trouble with the border, the immigration the entry. The entry. Mm -hmm. um, part of it was because I didn't have like an on, we didn't have an onward ticket. But I do feel like we were targeted in in that. Oh, we're like a family of color. We're trying to go into this country, and this you know uh, immigration official thinks that we're trying to like stay there forever. And he even with a U.S. passport, they were yeah. Yeah. yeah, like, yeah. oh, you're just here. You're just going to be like another immigrant. Yeah, he, he flat like, out told us he didn't trust our motives yeah. and that you'd be watching us. And uh, wow. yeah, it was yeah. it was the weirdest experience we ever yeah. had. And I think there were a couple other times where like in, Italy, there's yeah. lots of like in, in Italy, we yeah. had some like kind of racial slurs thrown at us as we were, you know, walking down the street and um, in Indonesia actually and it wasn't from an Indonesian but um I was at a store trying to talking to somebody trying to get like you know my phone fixed and this Australian German tourist walks in and assumes that I'm not a customer and just there like you know jumps socializing right and right jumps in and like demands to be served and I was like uh excuse me you know yeah. but so in in some cases it's like we get we do notice getting different treatment because of how we look but then in other cases like in Mexico um I feel like it gives us a chance to sort of blend in more yeah. because and in and in Asia too because like not until we open our mouths do we mm. look like do we <laughs> stand out you know what I mean yeah so we start speaking and realize we don't speak like, language oh, at all no, there's a little bit of a chameleon effect, which is actually kind of helpful, especially when when you're like in a new environment and stuff and you um so and I we've we've talked to plenty plenty of our friends who like 
um, you know, are, are not people of color and they've gone to like Europe and they have that same, same sensation, right. Of like being able to kind of blend in and not, and not stand out. So what's interesting. And then, you know, some of those friends feel awkward about going to like Asia or Mexico because they, they kind of stick out. And so it's kind of the same effect. It's just a flip of the different countries. Yeah, that, yeah. That we yeah I mean, play. I have friends who their kids have red curly hair and everyone wants to touch their hair, you know, because it, they've never seen that before. Yeah, yeah for um, sure. So it's, a, it's, it's interesting. There is a little bit of an, granted, is kind of like in, in a position of privilege, but like there is kind of an equalizing effect a little bit um, in the world schooling community because depending on where you travel to, of course, um, that people experience very similar, you know, microaggressions or just weird um, uh, behaviors, I guess, from, from cultures, depending on where they're at. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, one last question from Sonia B. She says, um, any tips for helping kids say goodbye to each um, friend or place or community? Has that been a struggle for you guys, for your kids? Uh, I think we thought it was gonna be, but I don't, well, I'll I'll say my thing and maybe maybe you. Um, So one of the things that I, we and some, a lot of other families do is it's, it's, we kind of say along the like, it's not goodbye. It's we'll see you next time, or we'll see and you. And it's true because we've seen you guys four times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and we, yeah, and it's it's a it is incredible like how seemingly frequent you see some of these people. We've actually seen there's a couple of world schooling families. Um, I think like you're included, and and one of our friends Martha and some of them we like. We've seen them probably more times than we've seen some of our f- friends that we live oh. near. <laughs> like different, different places around the world too. Yeah. I love that it's like, oh well, we'll see you here. And now we're gonna see you in this country yeah. and in another country. And sometimes not intentionally either. Like yeah. we saw them randomly in New York. We had no idea they were gonna be in New York and we just <laughs> happened to be there at the same time. Um and so so one of the things that we always do is like we we don't necessarily say goodbye. We're like, we'll probably see you again sometime. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's really helped. Like our kids, what's really amazing is, and I, I don't remember this necessarily from beforehand, but like our kids, both when they see, when they meet up with other kids, either new or people they'd seen before, especially when it's kids they've seen before, they're instantly just playing. There is like, it's like no time has passed. Um, and then even with new kids, like, they adapt well to different situations, but then the goodbyes are never, they're never hard for us anymore. They're like, they're like, and I granted every family is going to be different, but it's just like, it feels like for our kids, they're, they're able to say goodbye and then, and then, or, you know, we'll see you next time. Yeah. And then it's, it seems to work well for us. Yeah. And I mean, for the kids that are older now, there's Facebook kids messenger. Um, yeah. my, my daughter keeps in touch with a few friends on discord. So uh, yeah. or Instagram, they follow each other, you know, it depends on the age yeah. of your kids. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So thank you so much, Ashton and Clint. This has been such an amazing conversation. Yeah. It's gone a little longer than I initially <laughs> planned, but I just think you guys have a lot to share. So um, please come to the group and um, yeah. just check out what people have written and, and interact if you can. Um, everyone check out uh, Astrid's blog, check out her book, their wonderful game. Is there any other project or other things that you want to share like your Instagram or or anything we'll let you know I mean there's always something okay we're super (laughs) we're super ambitious so there's always things we're thinking about but nothing nothing officially planned uh, at this moment okay and then in the future everyone remember we want to create an empty nester travel group Uh, I'm thinking this Facebook group can turn into it yeah there you go yeah for sure (laughs) All right. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks so much. Thanks, and um, yeah, that's uh, a wrap. <laughs>